She just wanted to have fun singing it. He's all the man. And I think that that intimacy is what people become aware of. When he looks at me, it's you he sees. Most of the great jazz singers we think of today, jazz and pop singers, um, at that time it's really the same thing. Uh, Billie Holiday, uh, Frank Sinatra, Ella Fitzgerald, Sarah Vaughan, uh, Mel Torme, they all really come from the swing big band era. And even people like Peggy Lee, um, who's probably the closest of the big, big names to Julie London, um, and Sinatra, you think of them as having a really intimate uh, really low-key style, but they actually really belted it out. They had to sing in front of these big bands and big orchestras. And Julie had a different voice. She was really a, a, a fan of small nightclub jazz. Your lips were like a red and ruby chalice. When Julie made her New York debut, even the Big Apple's hard-bitten jazz critics were seduced by her charms. This London girl not only looks like a million dollars, but her voice is packed with a warmth which captivates an audience. All she does is sit on a stool on stage and sing. No wild arrangements, no swinging of arms and head, and no shouting of lyrics. She's always on key, and she phrases the music like an instrument. Her hit record, Cry Me a River, was no fluke. This girl can sing. It was a wonderful quote. I read it, she once said that she'd had a thimble full of voice and that she had to get really close to the microphone to, you know, to put it across. It was an the intimacy about it. And let's face it, music, popular music, whether it's rock and roll or whether this more kind of jazz standard kind of music that Julie put across, a lot of it's about sex. It's about the body, it's about intimacy. And I think you get that kind of bedroomy quality to listen to it. You feel like she's singing for you, whether you're a man or a woman. And there's something that draws you into her world. To the acclaim of her peers and industry critics, Julie was voted one of the best and most exciting new female singers of the 1950s. But her voice wasn't the only thing that won her adulation. Her sexy, sometimes racy album sleeves were to prove as popular as her music. One journalist described them as generating enough voltage to light up a theatre marquee. Even her record label conceded that Julie's success owed as much to her album covers as her musical talent. I like provocative covers, but Julie London's was an accident. An amateur photographer got that. She wasn't standing up, but reclining on a couch. The background was clean, so we just cut out the couch. I cropped it for her cleavage. It hit exactly what I wanted, because there was a certain dirty appeal about it. When the disc jockeys got their copies of the album, they almost invariably talked about the cover. I'll never forget Al Jarvis popular disc jockey at the time, saying on the radio, today I have a surprise. I'm not going to play Julie's record. I'm going to play her album cover. There was so much time, I think, taken over her record sleeves. And they're all portraits. They're all just her face, you know? Um, which is, is something that I've completely and utterly copied, because I just think, if you're looking for an album by someone you like, you want to see their face. The first approach with Julie, as you can see by the first cover, was cleavage and shoulders and a beautiful face. Uh, and I, I certainly don't knock that. Those are marvelous ingredients. But you can't do that for 30 albums. You've got to be able to do something that intrigues the visitor. When you get an artist, like Julie London, who is as beautiful as she is talented. It's a challenge to the photographers to try to do something that not only meets your standard of photography, but meets her standard of performance. You hear a voice and you have a mental picture of the, of, of the person. It may be nothing like the person. Uh, for instance, you hear Ella Fitzgerald, 
who's always sounded young. Even when she was middle-aged, she sounded young. She sounded like the perfect female voice. Ella Fitzgerald was no pin-up and never had been, even when she was young. Um, and when they made, as the albums started coming out, they tended not to have Ella's photograph on them. They tended to have designs or something like that. Whereas in the case of Julie London, well, I mean, she was a very beautiful girl. She had that nighttime look, which fitted perfectly with the repertoire that she sang and the style in which she sang. And so the whole thing came together. Another sunny. Her image was kind of embedded in those album covers, which are so distinctive. They kind of combined pin-up with a certain classiest, classier kind of quality about them. And the LP became something that's a very collectible object that everybody wanted to have. And those album covers really kind of broke Julie and also helped her find where she needed to be. It's really killing that he's so willing Make some whoopee. She always looks like she's having fun, but she's not exactly Betty Page. There's something a little bit more kind of prim about her, a little bit more mature. And the kind of come hither quality you see on those LP covers, you know, really gets it just right. There's a kind of balance of elegance and precision and sort of, you know, inv invitation, but in the most kind of demure sort of way. I sit alone. Most every night, he doesn't phone, he doesn't write. With that era, you get a kind of siphoning off onto particularly film and music stars. Desires, sexual fantasy, sexuality, whatever, in a rather prim and prudish society, superficially. And in that, she's kind of quintessentially of the 1950s. Only five in America, the 1950s is sort of defined in many ways, by the by the findings of Kinsey. What Kinsey laid bare was the fact that actually America wasn't a prudent society at all. Suppose I fail. But that there was lots of sex going on. There was lots of sexual fantasy going on. It was just that they didn't talk about it that much. And so it kind of came into the open. They were incredibly successful books. I mean, people bought them, obviously. They're, they're great reads. I think so someone like that, who in a way crystallised this whole notion of, well, we're not allowed to talk about it, but we know it's going on everywhere. And there's something about that in, in her performances. If I may, I would like to present another gentleman to you. His name is Mr. Uh, Donald Bagley. And Mr. Bagley plays his instrument very well. <laughs> Pack up all my kisses. Here I go. Where somebody waits for me, sugar sweet, so bye, bye, blackbird. It makes me laugh the way Julie treated various standards. I mean, she turn them on their head, effectively. I mean, I think of Bye Bye Blackbird, which is a sort of novelty tune, and she turns into this really sort of steamy, seductive thing, and she's, she's singing almost a cappella. She's flirting madly with the double bass player, and it, whew, you know, it's, it's amazing the way she performs that one. Whereas Sinatra really took, uh, is famous for taking ballads and swinging them, Julie took the opposite approach, and she also often took up-tempo numbers and really turned them into these languorous, uh, you know, laments or love songs. My baby don't care who shows. My baby don't care who clothes. My baby just 
just cares for me. My baby just cares for me. It's very interesting because hers is so much more sensual. When Nina Simone sings it, it's kind of like she's in charge. My baby just cares for me because I've told him so, you know, because I'm telling him he has to care for me. That's kind of her perspective on it, I think. Um, but when, when Julie sings it, it's like she's just got out of bed. Four rings are expensive things. He's sensible as can be. Anyone can put on a sparkly dress or high heels. Um, and they might be very pretty, but they won't be glamorous because glamour is kind of something from within. Yet for all her Hollywood glamour and movie star lifestyle, the role Julie most enjoyed was that of the suburban California housewife. Hey, little girl, comb your hair, fix your makeup. Soon he will open the door. Don't think because there's a ring on your finger, you needn't try anymore. For wives should always be lovers too. Run to this heart. She was kind of, you know, the classic beautiful, glamorous, Californian mother. There was a, a publication when I, I grew up with called Sunset, which is still going to this day, which sort of celebrated gardening, cooking, lifestyle. It was kind of a wallpaper of its generation. And there was something about all the shots of Julie in her fabulous home with her children, of course, not her husband, which just make me think of Sunset magazine and that sort of easeful style. She's like the, the ultimate glamorous suburban mom. Even the shade of blonde her hair was, which was a kind of sandy, natural blonde, rather than a brassy, platinum Marilyn Monroe or Jane Mansfield blonde, was very kind of California, the sort of naturalness, a sort of easefulness, which is uh, very typical of the West Coast. Time to get ready for love. Julie and her fiancé Bobby Troop had tied the knot in 1959 and soon had a Brady Bunch house full of children. As well as her daughters from her marriage to Webb, Julie became stepmother to Bobby's two teenage girls. The couple would go on to have three more children, a daughter and twin boys. So important was home and family to Julie that she recorded an entire album in her living room. You'd be so nice. Come home to. My favorite Julie London album is At Home with Julie. Nice by the fire. It was recorded in her house. People just came over. Jimmy Rolls, who uh, later was a mentor to Diana Krall, and one of the really unsung piano greats, led the album. It's got people like Al Viola on guitar. And you can just feel the good vibes. Under stars, she wanted to do an album with a, with a quintet or sextet.